crying already. It's late night. I was talking about Urban Meyer earlier. So obviously a very touchy subject. You know, you don't want to be offensive to Urban or his marriage. And, you know, you, at the same time, the media, everybody's blaming Urban. So uh, that's a serious topic, I guess, away from football. A little serious when you're talking about marriages and stuff, but also kind of comical with going out and getting lit up and grinding on girls. I mean, that stuff is just funny. Uh, could that be funny? Could it be insensitive to women? All of that is always possible in videos like that. But anyway, let's talk a little bit about um, the Giants and Daniel Jones, which is all football, which is not off the field, which is all on the field, which is, you know, which is pretty damn awesome to talk about all the time. I was so happy to see the Giants get a victory over um, over the uh, the football team out in New Orleans, the New Orleans football team. Uh, you know, the thing is that ended up transpiring in that game is that Daniel Jones, I mean, I thought that he lacked some arm strength and he showed off a little bit of arm strength in the throw to Kendarius Tony or in the throw to John Ross. John Ross, from everything that you hear in his interviews, he's one of the brightest people that I've ever heard speak um, outside of football, inside of football. This guy just seems like a very intelligent, like team first guy um, from all of his interviews and the way that he was at Washington. I mean, this guy's a speedster. This guy looks like a student of the game. Now, is he is he slight in frame? Yes. But the fact is, John Ross, I really love the potential. I love drafting track stars. You look at, at the Chiefs. They have, you know, B Byron Pringle, Papa Pringle. They also have guys like me, Cole Hardman from Georgia that are just so fast to get up and run, 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 run. And, 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 and um, the guy, John Ross from the Giants, like Joe Judge said, he showed great ability after he extended the ball to the pylon, which – was kind of a really stupid play if you think about it because you get the ball at the one he extends it over the pylon and the ball it was a fumble on that throw and he went and recovered it thank goodness nobody was even watching they thought that that was all you know extracurricular stuff him jumping on that football but that was a huge huge momentum play and Daniel Jones that was one of the longest touchdown throws I think that was the longest touchdown that the guy has ever completed in his NFL life the ball went from the 45-yard line to the five. He put everything into it. It went like 52 yards in the air. It is a dome stadium, but the throw was a tremendous, tremendous throw from Daniel Jones. I've, I've been asking Daniel Jones to hit these explosive plays. Then when everything was turning to absolute shit and the Giants D and Adoree Jackson were playing like crap and Adoree Jackson gave up that long touchdown to this undrafted kid from Tennessee who was very mediocre in college when he gave up that long completion that to, to Marquez Callaway. Um, it, it, Adoree Jackson is just maddening. This defense, they made Taysom Hill look like Walter Payton, like they couldn't tackle at all. They tackled horribly. And the defense in the third quarter was a joke. And if not for that holding call, the Saints would have won because they hit that touchdown and the Giants got very lucky with that holding call. So looking pretty much at the game overall, the Giants, the offense played better. The defense still leaves a lot to be desired. Um, but in the second half, that throw to Saquon Barkley might have changed the trajectory of Daniel Jones's career. If the Giants go on to beat the Cowboys, without that throw, the Giants are 0-4. I mean, Joe Judge, questionable decision, punts the ball back to New Orleans with nine minutes left. The Giants get a three and out or a six and out, which was unbelievable how that happened. I mean... Every time Judge has punted, it seems like the Giants get burned every single year. Like the defense cannot play comp complimentary, but all it, the Giants played very complimentary. It, everything worked perfectly the Judge's plan. He pinned them deep instead of going for it on fourth. The Giants get a three and out. CJ Board hits like a 25 yard return, gets him to a striking distance right at the middle of the field. And then, and then Jason Garrett dials up a beautiful decision receiving concept where one guy sits it down and then and then Saquon just goes on a fade route and the defense and Lattimore gets mixed up 
and Daniel Jones throws the ball at the right time, and Barkley does a great job of not just going out of bounds, but extending it back in the boundary and getting for and getting vertical for a touchdown. So utilizing Saquon Barkley like the Eagles utilized Brian Westbrook, that's exactly what I want to see from the Giants because the Giants O-line, they cannot run block for crap. So get Saquon, utilize him as a wide receiver because he's really fast and put him in matchup conflict with the defense. Daniel Jones, 400 yards in the game, which is beyond anything that I've ever would have expected from this kid. And Daniel Jones against the Falcons, he played decent. Against Washington, his pocket presence is getting better. He's stepping up into the pocket now. He's utilizing his bases is is better, meaning that he has a firmer, he's not fading away from throws now. His workout regimen in the offseason is better. His arm strength is now adequate level NFL arm strength. It's not It's not even good. It's average NFL arm strength. So Jones, he is tall, and he's utilizing his strengths. Now, the thing is about Jones is that can he put it together? Can this Giants team put it together? I mean, last year, they went on a three-game winning streak and went to Seattle and won and then had that clutch play against Brandon Allen last year in Cincinnati. The Giants now go to the Cowboys, their rival. The Cowboys and Dan Quinn, they have two of the best coordinators in the whole league in Dan Quinn and Kellen Moore. And I've been saying for forever that Kellen Moore is a boy genius, that he is absolutely <gasps> the most brilliant coach that's maybe in our league other than Brendan Staley. If I were to do that, the coaching rankings in the NFL, I would put Kellen Moore, probably number one, Brendan Staley, number two, you know, then you, then you possibly have, you know, Sean McVay, um, Andy Reid and Shanahan. Those are the top head coaches in the NFL. All right. Then maybe Brian Dable somewhere in the top 10. So, the thing that I would talk about, the thing that I would talk about with um with with going to Dallas is you don't want to go one and four. And if the Giants and Daniel Jones, if they cannot win this game, they're one and four, man. You got to start winning. I mean, in Washington, playing against the DC football team, they had a lot of chances in the second half to go drive down and go up by two scores, and they couldn't do it. Daniel Jones in the red zone and Jason Garrett, they were terrible in the red zone again. That Evan Ingram reverse play was terrible. Um, they're they're not out of the weeds yet. They got a they got a stack up production. And Daniel Jones in that Cincinnati game, after playing a brilliant game against Philadelphia, which was his best game, second best game now. The one so so if we're gonna rank his performances, Daniel Jones, it's got to be Bucks. It's got to be Eagles and it's got to be this game. Um, and then a close four and then a distant fourth is the Detroit game. If we're talking about Daniel Jones and his performances. But listen, this offense with Tony and stuff, they're going to be playing man to man defense. So the key, of course, is third down. Can Evan Ingram ca catch a pass on third down? Can you keep Dallas off of the field? Can you keep that, that offense? Can you keep Kellen Moore in his clipboard on the sideline and Dak Prescott, the MVP candidate? Can you keep those guys off the field? Because put it this way, if a Dory Jackson and James Bradbury are getting burned by Marquez Callaway and are getting burned by undrafted Saints receivers, you're going to have a big problem dealing with two first-round receivers in, in Amari Cooper and in the legendary C.D. Lamb, who is one of the greatest college receivers of all time at Oklahoma. You're going to have trouble with that team. Dalton Schultz playing at another level. Zeke Elliott looks like the old Zeke Elliott. Kellen Moore, they can attack you in so many ways, and I think the Giants in this game – I don't think this is going to be a high-scoring game. This is going to be a low-scoring game, meaning that even though it's low-scoring, you would think that low-scoring means defense. This is the this is something that that people should look at. Just because a game's low-scoring doesn't mean that the defense is any good. 
Like, was anybody going to say because the Bucs held the Tampa Bay, held the, the Patriots to 17 points that the Bucs defense was good against Mac Jones? No. The guy completed every single pass, and Richard Sherman was just getting off the couch. The Bucs secondary is a joke. Now, their defense in the red area, yeah. So the point is, when you play low possession football, it means the clock is running, you're playing cover two, you're letting the Cowboys get some yards, and the clock is running, but then you're banking on your defense in the tight red area to try to, to, try to stay in the game by, by holding you the field goals. So instead of playing aggressive defense, actually trying to achieve the punt and actually trying to achieve greatness, you're kind of just settling back and saying, all right, we got to play sound. We're, we're not better than this offense that we're playing. We're very scared of this offense. We don't have great secondary pieces in, in Adore Jackson and Bradbury. By the way, we need to see the guy from UCF get on the field this season. So that's the way this game's going to kind of play out. But with Daniel Jones... I said that he wouldn't be very good. I'm still in the drafting Malik Willis camp, but Daniel Jones controls his own destiny. If he stays healthy, this team beats the Rams or the Cowboys. This team with this very tough schedule gets to nine wins on the year and is right there at a wild card spot and Jones is good all year, then maybe Daniel Jones will reward himself with one more year. But to put it this way, Malik Willis is going to be the next Kyler Murray. Malik Willis is going to be a legendary Hall of Fame talented football player. Carson Strong is going to be an excellent quarterback in this league, a very good starter. He's going to start for a long time if he's drafted in the first round. And I believe he can do it. He has no mobility, so he's not as safe of a pick as Malik Willis, who's the safest pick you can make. Because Malik Willis is going to, from day one, light the league to flames. So, I don't know. The Giants passed on Justin Herbert for Joe, for Daniel Jones. And that's proving to be a little bit catastrophic at this stage. Are they going to pass on Malik Willis for Jones? I don't think I would do it. But the fact is, if this offensive line, if the middle of the offensive line can give Jones a clean pocket to step up into, that's the key. Because he is not a mobile outside of the pot. He is a strict pocket passer. He is like a Kirk Cousins and a Derek Carr. He is a pocket, pocket passer. Pocket, pocket passer. He's not even like Baker Mayfield getting outside the pocket. Just because he runs his own read does not mean that he's an improvisational guy. He is the most limited improvisational quarterback in the NFL. But Daniel Jones is accurate. He's smart. He's understanding the game better. He's not turning the ball over. And he's very accurate in the middle of the field. And he does throw with decent velocity when the throw is 15 yards and in. So Jones is capable of leading an offense and possibly winning some games. Now, does Jones have that killer instinct that I want from him? No, but can he gain it? Maybe. So Jones right now, again, I'm not fully enamored with this franchise quarterback, you know, talk. I'm not there. And I doubted Daniel Jones. So I, again, I'm in a win-win here because, hey, Jones doesn't do well. It makes you look better on your show. But I care about being a Giants fan. And they have, if you're one and four playing the Rams that are going to be off of 11 days, that ain't going to be fun. So you got to go into Dallas and this is how you're going to beat Dallas. You're going to run the ball, so the clock's going to, going to run on you. You're going to, again, hope Dallas scores only 24 points in the game and hope that you score 30 points. You're going to have to be great on fur down when you get opportunities. You're going to not have to do, you know, commit any penalties because you're room for error when you're playing this team that, frankly, just has better players and better coordinators your room for error is very tough when you don't have like the, the greatest players um, and when you don't have the upper hand in terms of the players because it looks like Dallas right now. This Trayvon Diggs guy looks like he might be a cornerback that's headed to the Pro Bowl, and he's a second-year corner, and he was considered the younger brother of, of the Bills wide receiver. He was considered an afterthought in this draft. He was considered at Alabama 
he wasn't considered like a Marlon Humphrey. He wasn't considered like a lockdown, lockdown corner, like a Maurice Claiborne was at LSU. You know, this, this, and Trayvon Diggs, what he's doing in Dallas under Dan Quinn is masterful. And I'm happy for Trayvon Diggs. Seems like a good guy. The Cowboys themselves, the players that the Cowboys have, Dak Prescott, they have great leaders. They have very upstanding characters on their team and, and great people. But again, Giants fan, going to not root for the Dallas Cowboys. No way. So this game is big for the Giants, much bigger for the Giants than the Dallas Cowboys that are sitting at 3-1. and one. If the Cowboys win this game, they pretty much lock up the division. This is going to be a show. Again, run the ball. Find a way, listen, find a way to get the short passing game going. Do a little bit of hurry up, but listen, snap the ball with 10 seconds on the play clock. All right, get the clock moving. This game is going to be a 27-24 type game. It's going to be around 50 points. The clock will be moving. The defenses will not be that great in this game. You won't see a lot of punts in this game. It's going to be low possession. Low possession, but but a lot of plays during drives, and the time will be will be chewed off. The first quarter might be like seven to three, either Giants or Cowboys. The Giants are going to be in this game, and then it just comes down to again: Are they going to execute when it matters? Are they going to have that winning mentality? Are they going to stay firm and actually complete this task? I believe they can complete the task, and you got to. You cannot go. You cannot go to one and four to start off your season. That is absolutely apprehensible and, and irresponsible and ridiculous. The amount of money that Gettleman has put in the Galladay, uh, has put into um, what's his name? Um, um, Leonard Williams. The fact that they spend money on a Dory Jackson, James Bradbury, Blake Martinez is hurt. But still, Andrew Thomas is a first-round guard. You have Jones and Saquon healthy now. You have Kendarius Tony, a first-round pick. You're using premium amounts of capital on this team to be pretty damn good this year. You got to go down to Dallas in a game that you need more than them, and you got to find a way to play clean football and win this game. And then you come back and play Matt Stafford, and you'll have a chance at beating him too. The Giants need to prove that they are a playoff team. In these two games, they need to work to get back to 500, okay? The Giants, again, as a fan, it's time for this team to start winning games and get back to 500. I'm not asking for much as a Giants fan to win these next two games and get back to three and three. I mean, three out of six, three and three. Come on now, guys. Giants fans deserve better. They've been through dog shit the past 10 years. The Giants deserve at least, at least a shot at a wild card and at least a shot at getting to 500 on the season. So before we start anointing these players, let's actually start winning more than just one game. But hey, Daniel Jones was clutch in overtime, showed the killer instinct. He actually played like Shermer in that Washington Redskins Chase Young era game. That's when Jones, too, hit Saquon Barkley on the wheel route in the first half. The Giants got up big in that game, like 21-7, to before their defense and James Betcher turned into a pumpkin. So um, that game in Washington, remember when Jones hit Caden Smith and then it was the Eli Manning and Daniel Jones went out to go play flip cups and napkins and a Hoboken bar, and, and so many people were upset because the Giants didn't have the number two pick in that draft. Instead, they had, what was it, the number six pick in that draft or something? Or was that when they selected Andrew Thomas? Probably. Yeah. I'll find that out. Chase Young draft. I believe it had to be Andrew Thomas. Twenty twenty draft. Hmm. Player selections. Yep, Andrew Thomas, twenty twenty. All right, guys, that's that. Thanks for listening. Twenty minutes of Giants football talk. Thanks for everybody who viewed this video. I do appreciate it.